34. I want to write. I want to write the songs of my people. I want to hear them singing melodies in the dark. I want to catch the last floating strains from their sob-torn throats. I want to frame their dreams into words, their souls into notes. I want to catch their sunshine laughter in a bowl, fling dark hands to a darker sky and fill them full of stars, then crush and mix such lights till they become a mirrored pool of brilliance in the dawn. I want to write. Dr. Margaret Walker Alexander was an educator, a scholar, a poet, an activist, a writer, a mother, a grandmother, a wife. She was a lot of different things. Born in 1915 in Birmingham, Alabama, which was a pretty inauspicious year to be born black in the Deep South. That's the year that the Ku Klux Klan reappears. That's the year that you get the film Birth of a Nation. Um, lynchings are almost at an all-time high at that point in the country. And she had parents who were highly educated. Her father would have a master's degree from Northwestern University as a Jamaican immigrant. Um, the family decided though that Birmingham probably wasn't the best place to raise an educated, cultured black family, so they moved to New Orleans where Margaret grew up and where she was really immersed in black culture. And in particular, her parents encouraged her reading and writing. And at the age of 13, her parents took her to a lecture by Langston Hughes and she got to meet him. Three years later, Langston published her um, first poem in the NAACP's Crisis, a little piece called I Want to Write. So at 16, she was getting Langston Hughes to publish her poetry in the Crisis. It's pretty heady company um, for a young woman, a young woman of color from the South. He um, would remain a lifelong mentor. She would go on to Northwestern for her undergraduate degree, which she got in 1931, a bachelor's in English. And in Chicago would meet, thanks to Langston Hughes, everybody who was anybody in the Harlem Renaissance and the Chicago Renaissance, and particularly close to Richard Wright, the writer, um, who from Mississippi published Native Son and Black Boy, probably his two most famous novels. Um, Margaret actually um, researched and typed the manuscript for Native Son for Richard Wright while she was living in Chicago. Joined his Southside Writers Group, took it over when he moved to New York, and would eventually move to Iowa where she started a writing program there that had just begun called the Iowa Writers Workshop, 1939. One of the premier writing programs to this day. Her master's thesis was a book of poetry by the name For My People, for which in 1942 she won the uh, Yale Younger Poets Prize, one of the most prestigious poetry prizes in the country, and she's the first African American to receive it. That prize launches Margaret Walker as um, a literary figure in the world. It's really the point that her fame um, just takes off. And she was doing work to lift up African Americans and the African American experience and demanding. Um, intellectual rigor and investigation and in and, and promoting culture and the arts, uh, especially to her students at Jackson State, was something that she took very seriously. And if you ever meet or know any of the students um, who came to JSU while she was here, they looked to her as this mentor figure. And here was this incredible woman who was friends with Langston Hughes, who knew Ralph Ellison whose first editor for her autobiography was W.B. Du Bois. Um, I mean, this is a woman who interacted in the upper echelons of black society, of American society, but she was committed to this place and these students and to the, to the uplift of these students in Jackson, Mississippi, which may have been the most dangerous place in America to be black, female, intellectual, artist, writer, novelist, poet, right? Uh, to be any one of those things was dangerous. To be all of them at the same time was revolutionary. She um, taught here at Jackson State from 1949 to 1979 in the college, in the Department of English and Modern Foreign Languages. She had this relationship with her students and 
don't get me wrong, she was a mentor, but she also was tough. I have yet to meet someone who had Margaret as a teacher and who didn't think she was the hardest professor they'd ever known. And there's stories of people running across campus to get to her class on time, because if you didn't get, her, get to her class on time, you didn't come in. The, the door was shut. Um, so she was tough, but she demanded a lot, right? She expected a lot out of her students, and she gave a lot to them. And that legacy between her, her scholarly commitment to the field of black studies and seeing it launched in part here at Jackson State and to her students is really rich. She founded the Institute for the Study of the History, Life, and Culture of Black People in 1968. And it was one of the first black studies programs in the United States. And she really was at the forefront of the black studies movement. If we think about college disciplines and majors like black studies, African American studies, Africana studies, African studies, things like that, they come out of the civil rights movement. They come out of young black activists saying, we want to learn and study about our own history and culture. And Margaret's creating one in 1968 in Jackson, Mississippi, five years after Megger's been assassinated. The same year Martin Luther King is assassinated in Memphis, two and a half hours up the road from Jackson. And she is bringing people who are at the forefront of this nascent movement to Mississippi. 1970, the same year as um, Philip Gibbs and James Green are murdered on our campus by city police and highway patrolmen, she has one of the very first national conferences on the topic of black studies, the 1970 National Viative Conference on Black Studies. 1973, she has the Phyllis Wheatley Poetry Festival. She invites 30 of the leading black female writers of the day to this campus, and 28 of those black women came. The only two who didn't come were Gwendolyn Brooks and Maya Angelou, and it was Alice Walker, and it was Sonia Sanchez, and it was Nikki Giovanni, and Paula Giddings, and Mari Evans, and Charlene Hunter Galt, and a whole host of others who all came just because Margaret invited them. She was a um, colleague of people such as St. Clair Drake, who founded one of the first black studies program at San Francisco State University. John Heinrich Clark, uh, James Turner were among the early black study scholars that she was um, acquainted with. She published the first neo-slave neo narrative, Jubilee, and we celebrated 50 years of that last year in, in 2016 that was published in 1966. She organized one of the first Martin Luther King birthday convocations for January 1969, the year after he died because she said she wanted to remember his birth and his life and his contributions whether, rather than commemorate his death. And those are just the things she did here at Jackson State. She was a world-renowned poet and author as well. Her artwork is iconic. For My People, Jubilee, uh, the, her essays on being female, black, and free, uh, the, her biography of Richard Wright, Richard Wright, demonic genius, her, you know, her intellectual work, her connection to the black arts movement and her influence in it, um, her work with black studies. Um, but, you know, also I think it is really important to think about her within the context of Jackson, Mississippi and Jackson State. And, and who she was as an educated black woman in a world that wasn't, it was obviously racist, but wasn't just racist, it also was sexist. And she came up against a male hierarchy in this city and state and university that opposed her, um, you know, in many of the same ways that the racist hierarchy opposed her um, as who she was as this female intellectual and, and artist. And so she was up against a lot and to think about what she accomplished, you really got to understand that what she was doing, her art was activism. It really was. If you think about the message of For My People. For My People Everywhere. Singing their slave songs repeatedly, their dirges and their ditties and their blues and jubilees, praying their prayers nightly to an unknown God, bending their knees humbly to an unseen power. In 1942, right, um, <laughs> it is um, pretty straightforward about what she hopes to accomplish and what she hopes to see and what she is seeing in American culture, um, especially faced by African Americans. 
I have had researchers from as far away as Beijing, China to reference her poem and to want to find out more information about For My People. Everything she talks about through that poem is relevant in 2017 as it was in 1937. She talks about religion, she talks about education, she talks about the need for leadership, principled leadership, leadership that knows where to go and is determined to help people to get in the right direction because she the poem talks about the facile force of state, meaning that people sometimes lean back too easily on leadership and that leadership is not always either honest or even equipped to do what they need. So a lot of things she talks about just in For My People is relevant today. Um, Jubilee, as I mentioned, which is a neo-slave neo narrative that's about her own family. It's about her great-grandmother and her grandmother. And you look at the conditions of life for women in the, from slavery through Reconstruction, and you see some of the same issues that we address today. Health care, uh, sexuality, education, politics, um, war. All of that is discussed in Jubilee, and all of those topics are relevant today. It's the first book from the perspective of African Americans going from slavery to freedom. And there would be others that would be more famous that would come after her, but she's the first. I mean, you get Roots 10 years later, you get Beloved after that, but Jubilee is the first of its kind. And she publishes that in 1966 in Jackson, Mississippi. That's three years after Medgar Evers has been assassinated in not only in the city that she lives in, but on the street that she lives on. She and Medgar Evers were neighbors here in Jackson. So a pretty revolutionary thing. And it is the story of her real great-grandmother and great-great-grandmother going, uh, and grandmother going from slavery to freedom. And the opening scene of Jubilee in 1966, in the heart of the Civil Rights Movement at Jackson, Mississippi, the opening scene is Margaret's great-great-grandmother dying in childbirth from being repeatedly raped by her master. That's a powerful message. <laughs> and to do that, to publish that book uh, to a worldwide audience is a pretty remarkable and courageous thing to do. And we just, it's never been out of print. We just had the 50th anniversary of Jubilee. We have a new 50th anniversary edition that's available now, an ebook available for the first time, audio books available for the first time, um, a new forward written by uh, Margaret's friend and another woman that she mentored, Nikki Giovanni. And so the, the worldwide impact is only growing, but especially if you consider what she was doing in the context of when she was doing it, it's an incredible legacy. Margaret Walker was an incredible woman with remarkable experiences over the span of her life who intersected with an incredible array of artists and writers and intellectuals uh, that is such a proud history for us at Jackson State and for the center in particular being her direct legacy. Well, of course, Jackson State was founded in 1877 as the Natchez Seminary in Natchez, Mississippi. Um, founded by a man who was a runaway slave who came back after the Civil War with the help of the American Baptist Missionary Society and founded this seminary. When the school moved to Jackson, its first location was actually in the basement of the historic Mount Helm Baptist Church in the Fair Street Historic District. Our second location in Jackson is where Millsaps College is today. Our third location in Jackson was Air Hall in 1903. This building, where we are right now, is not only the oldest building at Jackson State, it was the only building at Jackson State for a number of years. There was nothing else out here. And we actually had an image of that first class in 1903 sitting out on the stairs in front of Air Hall. And you considered the history that um, happened here and what was launched when that school finally landed permanently in a site, right now, 113 years later. You think about that history in this location, it's incredibly important. The building has been a number of things over the years. It actually burned in the 1930s. For 60 years, it was a three-story building. At one point, it was painted white and was an all-white three-story building. It was very ugly. Um, <clears throat> but my predecessor, Dr. Alfredine Harrison, who's a, a shero in her own right for the work that she did at Jackson State as a historian, as director of the Margaret Walker Center, 
raised the money to renovate Air Hall and to restore the fourth floor and to bring it back to the way it was originally meant to be. This building is here and represents a dedication to historic preservation and looking at how we as a people worked to educate ourselves and see the significance of education. And it's, it is a, an, an incredible place. We've been on the National Register of Historic Places since 1977. Uh, it used to be a women's dorm. At one point, two women named Joyce and Dory Ladner lived in this building. And when the Tougaloo Nine were arrested for their sit-in at the Jackson Public Library, Joyce and Dory Ladner led a prayer vigil on campus just outside this building and were immediately um, expelled from Jackson State for leading a prayer vigil. They transferred to Tougaloo, graduated from Tougaloo, um, but would go on and be okay. I mean, Joyce Ladner went on to be the president of Howard University after getting kicked out of Jackson State while living in this building for you know, carrying on a prayer vigil for civil rights activists. So an incredible history, a rich one, and a very important building that's central uh, to our history at Jackson State, our legacy at Jackson State, and as a home to the Margaret Walker Center, it's pretty fitting in terms of the connection and the work that we do today. Let a bloody peace be written in the sky. Let a second generation full of courage issue forth. Let a people loving freedom come to growth. Let a beauty full of healing and a strength of final clinching be the pulsing in our spirits and our blood. Let the martial songs be written. Let the dirges disappear. Let a race of men now rise and take control. <laughs>